Hello, I'm Otis Corbett. Now today I want to share a word about the Master of Spirits as I comment on a passage from Mark chapter 5. This comes from a sermon I preached at Mobley Creek Baptist Church on March 19th, 2023. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to bring a, a word today, share a word about the master of spirits from Mark chapter 5. A word about the master of spirits from Mark chapter 5. You know, sometimes in our lives, we lose what pilots call situational awareness. Now, sometimes when you lose situational awareness, it's okay, it's not a problem, nothing bad happens. But for a pilot, if they lose situational awareness, they lose track of what's going on, going on around them, uh, that could be problematic. It certainly could be difficult for uh, a plane that uh, a pilot gets confused and it would be not a good thing. But we sometimes get uh, that same way in our everyday life. Sometimes in our everyday life, we lose situational awareness. There was this fellow once who owned some dogs. He owned five dogs. And uh, where he was, he could not have a uh, real fence, so to speak. And so what he did was he got one of those electric fences or electrical fences and electronic fences. What it was, it was a buried wire around the perimeter of his property. And um, the dogs all had a collar on. And when the dogs crossed that line, they would get shocked. And they would go back, of course, it was a mild shock and didn't hurt the dogs. But uh, uh, one day, uh, the man lost situational awareness. He had to take one of his dogs to the vet. So he put him in the car and he backed the car out of the driveway. And, you know, he forgot to turn the fence off. And that poor, that poor dog had a shocking experience when he backed out of that driveway. But they say what goes around comes around. And one day, uh, the man had uh, hired someone to come and groom his dogs. And so they had come to the house and they said, well, do this right. I, I need you to take the collars off. And the man took the collars off and he was holding them. And uh, at that time, he saw that the mailman had come and he walked out to the road to get his mail. <laughs> and he lost situational awareness. And guess what? He had a shocking experience too, but it was five times as bad as for his four, poor uh, puppy dog. We can make a mistake when we lose track of what's going on around us. And in fact, we think that we are at peace in this country. One of the big advantages that this country has, or actually this country has two big advantages when it comes to, to being at peace, and they're called the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. It's a long way to get here, and so we have a country that's mostly at peace. But the fact is, we're not at peace because there is a spiritual war raging. It's been raging since before time, and it continues to rage. It will rage all the way up until the last days, and then someday it will be put to an end. But right now, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now, as we read that passage of scripture, what we see is there is a fight going around us that we don't see. And so sometimes we lose our situational awareness. We forget there is a battle that's going on, but that battle is still out there. Um, when we bought our house in Rose Hill, we got a termite bond. And every year, 
in just a few more months, they're going to come and they're going to check our little traps to see if we have termites. You guys see what can happen is termites can infest a house and you don't even know they're there until the wood starts to crumble. And so we need to see that we're in a spiritual situation, a spiritual war, and we need to realize that humanly, we're not equipped to fight that war. We're helpless babes on a spiritual situation. We have a hard time fighting uh, nature or controlling nature or protecting ourselves from things like tornadoes and hurricanes and diseases, much less the spiritual things that we don't even see. Well, today we're going to see that we have a champion that can win that war that we have someone uh, that we can turn to who can fight that battle and he has the ability to win it every single time. Turn with me again to Mark chapter five and we'll begin reading in verse one. Then they came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had uh, come out of the boat, immediately there met a, uh, him a, uh, out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains and the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles broken in places, or excuse me, in pieces, and neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. Father, we pray your blessing on this word that you have given us, your revelation to us. And we pray, Father, today that we will gain our situational awareness back about the spiritual battle we're in, but more importantly, that we will see the champion we have that wins that battle every time, and he does it for us. And we pray now in Jesus' name, amen. So we begin Mark chapter five by seeing a fearsome spirit, a fearsome spirit. Now, what we see here is someone that people were afraid of. They were scared of this man. They were scared of this one who lived in the mountains and who lived in the tombs and who could not be tamed and who could not be controlled. Now, what, what we need to know about Satan is reflected in this man as well. See, what we need to know about Satan is that Satan is about the business of making people afraid. He wants us to be afraid, and people are afraid of Satan. They are afraid of his power, and they are afraid of his evil nature. <coughs> And they're afraid because we can't see him. Those things that go bump in the night scare us. Those things that we cannot see frighten us. And we may see the results of it the next day, but then we don't know what happened. Many times what you'll find in, 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 in human nature or human stories is you'll find that um, there'll be something that took place. Maybe some animals were were killed or, or or something happened in other happened in nature and we can't explain it. <clears throat> and people, because of our nature, will ascribe those things to, to Satan or to evil forces. And we are afraid of Satan and we're afraid of demons. And humanly, we're afraid of these <clears throat> evil forces. Now, I want to tell you here today that for a Christian, much of this fear is absolutely unnecessary. It's absolutely unnecessary because, see, we confuse fact with fiction. We'll take uh, what we see in our culture. We'll see, take what we see in movies and on television and, and we'll adapt that as reality. Again, we're losing our situational awareness. We don't know the facts of the case, but what we'll do is we'll take things that we see in horror movies or, or other books and things of that nature, and we'll adapt them as 
facts. And so we have been conditioned by Hollywood productions and things of that nature. We've been deceived by overcooked and hyped stories of Satan worship that happen sometimes. And the fact of the matter is, very rarely does that actually take place. Because you know what? Satan doesn't care about people worshiping him. He, they don't, he doesn't care about people. He's got a different agenda. And what happens is these things are misleading to us. You see, the thing you got to understand about Satan is Satan's goal is to topple God. His goal is to become God. Satan was proud and Satan decided, hey, I'm the most beautiful of all the angels and I, I've got the, the greatest voice and I am just a wonderful thing and I'm going to take over God. And because of that, he was ejected from heaven and he was ejected from being constantly in God's presence. And he hates God with a passion you don't know. So how does he hate God enough? Well, what does he do to hate God and to hurt God? How does he get back at God? He gets back at God through people. He gets back at God by scaring people. He gets back at God by uh, frightening God's greatest creation, which is you and I. You see, when God created the world, he said everything was good. When he made humans, what did he say? It was very good. We, in, in the process of creation, he created uh, uh, the, the earth and the waters and he, he created the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and the animals. And he kept working and he kept working and he kept working. And then when he created us, he rested. And Satan's desire is to hurt God by hurting us. At the same time, we need to remember that Satan... Although he has power, he doesn't have power over Christians. The Holy Spirit lives in the lives of Christians and God and Satan cannot be in the same place at the same time. That's not possible. Satan is gonna be cast out from God's presence until God allows him in and God doesn't allow him in our lives. And so we don't need to be afraid of Satan the way someone who's not a Christian needs to be afraid of Satan. We really give him way too much credit. Satan is not another God. He's just a created being. He is a spiritual being, but he's one that has limited powers compared to God. And God is on our side and he is in our lives. At the same time, however, we must not denigrate the fact that Satan is a terrible creature that Satan is real, he does exist, he is evil, and he is powerful. And as we look at the subject of this story, we're going to see that Satan has real power and he affects people in a real way. Look at verse 3. Well, let's look at verse 2. And when he came out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him, not even with chains. Then look at verse five. And always night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. This man's existence was a living hell. And it was a living hell because of what Satan was doing in his lives. He was a fearsome spirit and everybody was afraid of him and they should have been. He was supernaturally powerful and he was affected and infected and possessed by evil. But we see something else here. We don't just see a fearsome spirit in this chapter. We see a freeing spirit. Look at uh, verse six. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, what, I have, to, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you will not torment me. And he said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion for we are many. And he also begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. 
Now a large swine, a herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. And so all the demons begged him saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the spine into the swine. There were about 2000 and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. What we see There was a fearsome spirit there in the place of the Gadarenes, but what came to the place of the Gadarenes across the the sea was a freeing spirit. So when this man saw Jesus, he immediately came and he worshiped Jesus and he begged Jesus for help. So when we are oppressed by Satan and we are oppressed by evil, I don't say possessed as Christians, but we can be oppressed. We can be tested. We can be tried. We can be tempted by Satan. When those things come into our lives, the answer that we should give is the same answer this man did. We need to run to Jesus. We need to run to Jesus and bow down before him and worship him. Because what will happen is that when we are in the presence of Jesus, the the spirits will will flee. The spirits will run out. Jesus was a freeing spirit and he knew who these people were. He knew or who these spirits were. He understands the spiritual world. See, Jesus never has lost situational awareness. He always knows with whom he's dealing. He always knows what the situation is. We also know from the scriptures that Satan had uh, 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 had uh, confronted God on several occasions, not the least of which was in the book of Job. That he came into the book of uh, the book of Job and he came to God in in presence of God and accused Job, the righteous man, of of only loving God because of what God did for him. So we know that. God knows who Satan is. We know who Jesus is. He is God. He know, we know that Jesus understands who Satan is. We also know that in the uh, life of Jesus, not long before this event, he had had an up close and personal account with Satan when Satan tempted him after he had been out in the desert fasting. And so Jesus knew who this person was. And who reacted to fear with fear in that case. Was Jesus afraid? Jesus was not afraid. Who was afraid were the demons. The demons were the ones that were afraid and they should have been because Jesus had the power to act and to take care of this man. And he did that. Satan had made this man's existence a living hell, but who released him? Jesus released him. Jesus prevented these spirits from going into somebody else's life and ruining their life as well. And in the end, we'll see a little bit later on down in the passage that this man ended up dressed and in his right mind. Jesus did a complete job in this task of freeing this man from the evil spirit. In doing this, he showed his complete mastery over Satan and all of Satan's demons. See, again, Jesus knew who he was dealing with. Satan knew he was dealing with. And the one that was scared was Satan. And the one where the spirits had to flee was not Jesus. It was the evil spirits because Jesus is the master of these spirits. So we see a fearsome spirit, a fearsome spirit, somebody people are afraid of. And then we see a freeing spirit, a freeing spirit who can free us from the oppression and temptation and assault of Satan. But now we see another kind of spirit. Let's look at verse 14. So those who who fled the uh, who fed the swine fled and they told it in the city and in the country and they went out to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and they saw the one who had been demon possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. 
Now those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. And they began to plead with him to depart from their region. What we see here is that the, the townspeople had a fearful spirit. The man possessed was a fearsome spirit. Jesus was a freeing spirit, but these people had a fearful spirit. Remember, Satan does his work through being someone who inspires fear in our lives. And these people, although they had not seen the event, they were afraid of what had happened. Now, this was a a dynamic experience, and it caused a lot of different reactions. No one who is confronted with Jesus in a real way ever goes away unchanged. If you see the apostles, they were called by Jesus. They left their nets. They left their boat. They left their counting house, their their, uh, uh, other tasks of life, and they all went to Jesus. The woman with a issue of blood, she was healed from Jesus. Uh, The man who was blind could see again. The the lame man could walk again. No one in the scriptures who ever had a, a confrontation with Jesus goes away unchanged. Now, these people reacted one way, whereas the former demoniac reacted an entirely different way. These people reacted with a fearful spirit. And they reacted with a fearful spirit because they did not know Jesus. They looked at Jesus and said, you ain't from around here, are you, boy? What you been doing? Why are you killing all our pigs? I'm not sure. I'm not I don't know who your daddy was. I didn't go to school with your sister. We don't know you. We'd just rather you go away because you're causing trouble. See, they'd rather put up with the devil they know than the Savior they don't know. You know, there's a saying, better the devil you know than the devil you don't. Uh, Huey P. Long was the governor of Louisiana back in the 30s. And Louis, Huey P. Long was a crook. He was a crook. Everybody knew he was a crook. Uh, and, and one time when he was running for, for, uh, for governor, he admitted, he said, yeah, I'm a crook, but I'm your crook. <laughs> I'm a crook for you. See, they didn't know this Jesus. They were scared of what Jesus did because they saw power that came out of Jesus and they didn't understand it because they couldn't control it. And even today, there are plenty of people who are afraid of Jesus's power in their lives. They're afraid that if they meet Jesus, something is gonna have to change. They're gonna have to maybe come to church and worship him. Maybe release part of their lives or all of their lives to his control. And control is very important. I like to drive when I'm going someplace because I like to be in control. I just be honest with you. All right. That's just the way it is. I like to drive uh, when I'm going someplace because I like to be in control. I really don't like anybody else. I'll ride with other people, but I just soon drive myself because I like to be in control. Uh, We need to realize that a drowning man, usually a drowning person, usually has to allow the lifeguard to save them. The the drowning person usually has to give up efforts to be saved by themselves so that the lifeguard can save them. Oftentimes, we'll take our broken toys in our lives to God, and then we'll snatch them back from him before he's finished fixing them. People are afraid to risk on the behalf of Jesus. But here's the thing, trusting God with our lives is no risk at all. People often will say the words, well, I bet this will happen or I'll bet that will happen. I've stopped 
I've stopped saying that because I don't bet on anything. I just don't. I don't I don't gamble. I don't bet on anything. But there is one thing that I have bet upon, and that is that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and he's got the strength and ability and will and desire to save me. I have placed all my chips on that one fact. And I believe the scriptures tell us, and I believe the testimony of many other saints before us will tell us that that's really not a risky bet at all. In fact, that's a a sure thing because we see here that Jesus had power, but the local folks, boy, they didn't want to receive him because they were scared of him. They had a fearful spirit. Now I said, no one goes away after meeting Jesus unchanged. Let's look at a different spirit. Look at verse 18. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but, but said, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has compassion, has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marvel. What we see here, in contrast to the fearful spirit of the people of that coast, we see a follower spirit. Because again, no one's ever gone away from Jesus unchanged. This man was released from demons. Other people have been released from physical illness, blindness, lameness. Lazarus was released from death. And of course, anyone who receives Jesus as Savior and Lord is released from the penalty of sin. Nobody goes away from the G- from Jesus unsaved. Some people go away from Jesus rejecting him and more condemned than they were before. But everyone comes away from Jesus different than when they saw him. And the best response to Jesus is the response of gratefulness. We should be grateful for what Jesus has done in our lives. This man was released from a living hell and he was grateful. Now, the truth of the matter is people aren't always grateful when Jesus does things for them. Once Jesus healed 10 lepers at one time, that's, that's pretty good to do. You know, 10 for one, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, you, you get a two for one deal, and you know, or, you know, he had a 10 for one deal. But yet only one of the lepers came back to thank him. We need to be grateful to Jesus. We can never repay him for what he's done for us, but we can be grateful to him. And the way we can be most grateful to Jesus is the same way this man was in that he wanted to follow Jesus. He wanted to be one of Jesus's followers. Now, Jesus said, no, I've got something else I need you to do. He said, I need you to go out and tell people what I did for you. And this man did. He went to the Decapolis. So in that part of of the the Middle East, when you get to uh, what we know as the Sea of Galilee up in North Israel, on the northeast side of the Sea of Galilee, there were 10 cities. Decapolis means 10 cities. And this man, this demon, formerly demon-possessed man, this man who now had a follower spirit, went to all 10 of those cities. We don't know how many times, but multiple times, and people heard about Jesus, and people's lives were changed. When Jesus sent out the 12, and when he sent out the 70, to do ministry in his name, they came back saying, even the demons are subject to us. You see, what happens when people are encountering Jesus and they're grateful for what Jesus has done for them and they become witnesses for Jesus and people hear about Jesus and people impact, uh, Jesus impacts people's lives and then people's lives are changed. What happens then is the abundant life that Jesus promised us in John 10, 10 happens. When Jesus was about to ascend into heaven, he told his disciples, you will be my witnesses 
in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. This guy was the first one. He was the leading edge of that command. Now, he didn't hear from Jesus the same exact words as in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but it's a very similar thing. Go and tell them what I've done for you. The same thing happens in our lives. We are to be witnesses for Jesus. And you know what we are? We are witnesses for Jesus one way or the other. The question is, which way are we going to be witnesses for him? Are we going to be ugly witnesses? Are we going to be pleasant witnesses? Are we going to be uh, rude and evil witnesses and mean witnesses? Are we going to be positive witnesses? Are we going to be incomplete witnesses? Are we going to be full witnesses? I was hearing uh, just yesterday at disaster relief training or Friday disaster relief training we had at the association, uh, our trainer was talking about how this saying goes around. It says, uh, uh, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. Sounds good, doesn't it? But what he said is in years uh, since we have become a very powerful uh, force in disaster relief, more and more groups are wearing the same color shirts that we started with. It's goldenrod. It's what that shirt color is called, I think. And it is, it'll blind you. But, ever, but, but since disaster relief became a, a major ministry of emphasis in the Southern Baptist Convention, we've been wearing those yellow shirts, but now other people are wearing those yellow shirts. So we can't count on the idea that if we just do good things, people will know it's Christians doing good things. We actually have to tell them. Like this man had to tell the people in those 10 cities what Jesus did for them, not for him. Jesus is the master of spirits. We're in a spiritual battle on a daily basis that we are not equipped to fight. As humans, when we come to a spiritual battle, it's like bringing a knife to a gunfight. That is not a career-enhancing effect when you bring a knife to a gunfight. It's, it's a bad day. We are not spiritually equipped, but Jesus is. He's the master of spirits. And when we need help in our lives, we turn to Jesus. He's there anxious to help us. And then when he helps us, all he asks is that we be grateful and we tell people. Father, I pray your blessings now on this church. I pray, Father, for your work to continue here in a mighty and powerful way. I pray, Father, that as we look to Easter, we will do our very best to invite people to come to worship because Easter should be the Super Bowl of our worship. We should focus on worshiping you in a mighty and powerful way on that day. And I pray that people would come to this church. They would hear about your son, the master of spirits, the master of all things, the one who can help us in every aspect of our lives, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, relational, everything that we need, everything we need help with, we can find it in Jesus. Thank you, Father, that he is our champion in this war that we're fighting, this spiritual war that we are embroiled in. And, and Father, as we are, really, we are, we're collateral damage. We know Satan is trying to beat you any way he can, and we know that'll never happen. But thank you that Jesus takes care of us. And we pray, Father, that we would serve you ever the more fully now because of knowing that Jesus is our master of spirits, and he's there for us all the time. In Jesus' name, amen.